Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And today I would like to look at three operational amplifier circuits that all electrical and computer engineers should know by heart. I'm going to draw three op amp circuits. And for the purposes of today's discussion, I'm going to assume that these op amps are quote unquote ideal, meaning I'll assume that they have infinite bandwidth and infinite gain and that the inputs have infinite input impedance, so there's no current flowing through the inputs. Now, if you have something like a TL072 that has inputs consisting of JFETs, that's a pretty good assumption. This will have a really, really high input impedance. Now, if you have something like a 5532 that has BJTs at the inputs, then you're gonna have not so great input impedance. You will have some current flowing through there and BJTs by part of the way that they operate have to have some current flowing in there. But whatever op amp you're using, 072, 5532, whatever, for the purposes of today's discussion, let's just go ahead and assume things are ideal. And that's usually good enough for designing things. You may go back and tweak various resistor values later if you have to, but it'll usually be close enough. The last thing that we're going to look at, we'll have just the output hooked to the negative input. So we'll write this as VI and VO. The middle one here will have a resistor I'm going to call R1 that goes to ground to the negative terminal. And then we'll have a feedback resistor RF connecting to the output. And then our input will go in here. I could have called this something like RG for the resistor to ground. I'm going to use R1 to make it sound a little more generic. The first one we're going to look at will have the same kind of feedback resistor RF, only the input here in this case is going to go into the negative terminal through this resistor I'm going to call R1 to kind of stay somewhat consistent with the notation here. I could have called this something like RI for R input, but I'll go ahead with R1 here. Now in the case of this first circuit, this guy will be grounded at the positive input. So let's scoosh this over. Let me draw in the output here. We have VO and VO. All right, so here's what I want you to have memorized. The output of this circuit here on the left is going to be equal to minus the feedback resistance over this R1, this input resistor, times VI. So this is a circuit with an inverting gain of RF over R1. The output of this middle circuit is going to be one plus RF over R1 times VI. So this has a non-inverting gain of one plus RF over R1. So unsurprisingly, we call the circuit on the left an inverting amplifier, and we call the circuit in the middle here a non-inverting amplifier. Another thing to notice is that this RF over R1 factor can be less than one, so the gain can actually be attenuating. Whereas for the non-inverting amp, this factor is bigger than one, so it has to be a true gain, I guess you could call it. Now the circuit on the right here is actually a limiting case of the circuit in the middle. If you let RF equal zero, or you let R1 equal infinity, you wind up with an equivalent circuit where we'll have VO equal to VI. So we'll call the circuit on the right either a voltage buffer or a voltage follower. Now, how do we remember these formulas? The main thing to remember is that the feedback resistance goes in the numerator. To actually derive the formulas, we could take your usual sophomore introductory circuits class approach and write down Kirchhoff current law equations for the node sitting here at the negative terminal input of the op amp and solve those. But if you're being interviewed for a position at analog devices or Texas Instruments, I don't want you to do that. I want you to just immediately have these formulas at your fingertips and be able to say them right away in a job interview. The main thing is that if you want to think about designing with circuits as a creative act, you don't want things slowing you down. So if you have these kinds of facts at your fingertips, it frees you up to be able to think outside the box.
The main thing to remember is that the feedback resistor goes on top. And the way to think about that is to think about the effect of negative feedback. Remember, negative feedback in general lets you trade off bandwidth and gain. So negative feedback lowers gain. Let's think about the non-inverting amp for a moment. If we think about the voltage at the negative terminal, let me call it V minus, let's write that in terms of the voltage at the output terminal here. The negative terminal will see the output voltage through a voltage divider that's R1 over R1 plus RF. So the voltage is being divided down this R1 resistance. So let's think about that for a second. If we were to increase RF, then we are decreasing the amount of feedback, which increases the amount of gain. So it makes sense that RF is in the numerator. Now what happens if we were to increase R1? Well, this factor here is a number that's less than one. And as you increase R1, it's going to get closer and closer to one. So that means that the amount of feedback is increasing which should lower the gain. So if you increase R1, this whole factor drops and everything is consistent. So notice in the extreme case, if I were to decrease RF or increase R1, eventually we get a case where VO and V minus would be the same, and then we wind up with this voltage buffer effect. Again, all of this is assuming that our op amps are following the golden op amp rules for negative feedback, so the outputs are creating whatever voltages and currents are necessary to try to hold these input terminals to be the same voltage. But that's all a consequence of the effect of the feedback. So you can do a analysis of the inverting amp similar to what I just did for the non-inverting amp. Before we talk about input and output impedances, I want to say a few words about typical unwritten assumptions when we interpret diagrams like this. I wrote an input voltage here, and what that is really representing is that I have some ideal voltage source, VI. And then over on the other side, I assume that we're measuring VO here, this output voltage, using some sort of ideal voltage measurement mechanism that's measuring a voltage with respect to ground. But whatever this is on the other side, whatever system we may be feeding into it, has infinite input impedance, so it doesn't load the circuit down. Now, it doesn't matter much here anyway, because we're assuming that these op amps are ideal. So this op amp has zero output impedance. So even if it had some finite resistance here, we wouldn't need to worry about that. Similarly, over here, we're imagining that there's some ideal voltage source providing the input. And over here, we have some ideal voltage source that's providing the input. And we're measuring the outputs over here using some infinite input impedance devices that are measuring that output with respect to ground. That doesn't look great, does it? Oh well, close enough. We'll usually not explicitly write these voltage sources. Just the fact that we write VI, we know it's an input, we'll make this assumption. Now, some textbooks will go a step further, especially introductory textbooks, and they won't use ground symbols. They'll explicitly connect all of these grounds together. That is something that only happens in textbooks, so you need to get used to not seeing these kinds of connections being explicitly made. So now let's talk about input and output impedances. I'm going to use lowercase r here. If we're actually dealing with capacitive and inductive elements, I would use a lowercase letter z. Don't read anything special into the fact that I'm using lowercase letters to represent input and output impedances. The reason I mention that is that a lot of times we'll use lowercase letters to represent special small signal or AC values. Here I'm just using lowercase to try to differentiate from the capital R's that represent the fixed resistors in the various circuits. And actually, let me redraw this a little bit to try to more clearly indicate what I'm meaning. Let me extend this out a little bit, write VN over here, and then I'll write my RN symbol here. Let me start with the easiest one first, which is the output impedance, because the output impedance of all of these circuits is zero. So why is that? Well, 
Remember, we're assuming that the op amps are ideal. So the outputs of the op amps are ideal voltage sources with zero output impedance. So the outputs here are free to create whatever voltages are needed to hold these inputs at virtual ground. Now, the most common errors students will make here is that they'll say that R out is equal to RF, and that's not true. Now let's think about input impedance. For the non-inverting amp and the voltage buffer, the input impedance is infinite. And why is it infinite? Well, we're taking our input and jamming it right into the positive input of the op amp. And again, we're assuming these are ideal op amps and hence have infinite input impedance. The trickiest one to think about is the input impedance on the inverting amp. And that turns out to be R1. And the reason is that assuming that this op amp is ideal and is following the golden op amp rules, here this negative terminal is being held at a virtual ground. So whatever voltage source you have over here sees a resistance to a ground. So that's just whatever that resistance R1 is. As far as the voltage source over here is concerned, it doesn't care if it's a virtual ground or a quote-unquote real ground. It's still going to be R1. Students will often write things like R1 plus RF. It's not that. They'll want to write R1 in parallel with RF. It's not that. <laughs> it's none of those things. It's just R1. So all of these circuits, as far as the outputs are concerned, are pretty nice because they create a clean break between different parts of your circuit. You do have to be careful in the case of the inverting amplifier. If you have a output that's less than ideal driving it, you may have to deal with the fact that you might get a voltage division effect with this input impedance of R1. In general synthesizer type applications, for instance, values from R1 will tend to range from something like 10K to 100K with something like 50K to 100K actually being a little more common. Now, you might wonder, well, why 10,000 or why 100,000? Let's say I wanted to build an inverting amplifier and I just said, hey, let's let R1 equal 10 mega ohms and let RF equal 10 mega ohms. What will that do? Well, that would invert the signal without having any gain or attenuation. And it would also present a super high input impedance. Look at that 10 mega ohms, that would be huge. But in general, this is bad. And the reason you don't want to use such high resistances is because of noise. And the higher the resistance is, the more noise you have. Let's say we were to change this from 10 mega ohms to just 10 ohms. Okay, so these are very small resistors. Those would have very low amounts of noise. But this is going to be bad news too. You don't want to do this. Why don't you want to do this? Because of the high currents you'll wind up with in most practical applications. If you have a very small resistor here, you're relying on this voltage source being able to produce a ton of current. And more to the point, you're relying on your op amp to be able to produce a ton of current. And I know I've repeatedly said that we're assuming that these op amps are ideal, but real world op amps are not. And running up against voltage limits on your op amp outputs is not necessarily a big deal. In fact, in my analog circuits for music synthesis class, we look at a circuit by Don Buchla that does that on purpose. But running up against current limits is bad news. Running up against current limits means heat, and heat means destroying your op amp.